Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Vance. Thanks for joining us today to talk about something we've been very excited to get going for a while, which is the series on rendering engine architecture. While I'm now the CTO of Activision Publishing, for most of my 20 years in this industry, I've been a systems programmer, primarily working on rendering code or rendering adjacent code. The idea of this series of talks was to discuss the varying approaches to rendering engine architecture in games. For instance, what different decisions do we make if we're a bespoke engine versus a platform versus a licensed engine technology? In our case, as a bespoke piece of technology for shipping specific games, we have some philosophical ideas that are important to us. Constraints, how to choose them and the specialization they unlock, and the importance of validating them over time. Prioritization of work based on knowing the technologies used end to end, how specialization unlocks efficiency, and how we can reason about correctness with large knowledge about the technology's use. And last, how we can engineer for resiliency in our code and why that's valuable. My daughters like to dispel notions of the excitement of working on games by describing it as staring at a screen for several hours with an annoyed look, which is pretty much spot on. Uh, what I was usually looking at was a performance analysis tool, and this talk is largely a tale told in analysis tool captures, with some other pretty pictures to boot. At this event, there are possibly some people who haven't worked in these tools that much, so I'm going to do a quick overview of what we'll be looking at, since this tool forms the basis of a lot of my slides. This is Razor CPU, which is our preferred analysis tool for CPU work and understanding of execution. At the very top, we have a timeline with a frame marker. Time moves from left to right. Below that, the physical CPU layout showing our named threads. You'll notice on this capture that we have two clusters with four cores each. Each cluster has its own L1, but they share an L2. This next section is the logical thread view. These are syscalls. You can see the gaps in the logical thread markers correspond to operating system calls, like synchronization primitives, such as mutexes and condition variables. Here we have user markers, which are pushed and popped by the client with custom names, as shown. And down here, you have PC samples from the executable, including call stack blocks. I like to look at things from a ground truth state on the hardware first, so let's begin there, and we'll take a look at it from a higher logical pipeline view later. Our titles operate around three primary threads, which unfortunately have a few names each. Main, client, and front end for the first major thread, render, back end for the second, and for the last thread, server. We have multiple names because some have multiple systems responsibilities, and since that can be a little confusing, we'll try to use them consistently as front end, back end, server, because this talk is about rendering, and front end, back end is one of the core distinctions. We also instantiate worker commands to cover the remaining cores. Database is a special file service thread that cooperatively shares a core with the worker. For those unfamiliar, on some consoles, the last core is shared partially with the operating system, and so you want to schedule work that is robust to latency on there, and audio can mix ahead in time, so we have a large group of audio threads that are set up for that purpose. Last, there are lightweight task threads that exist with looser affinity to cover low-frequency operations such as save game processing, cinematics, and others. Let's look at the front end first. It's responsible for network packet gathering, input sampling, and scene graph traversal, which is our front end rendering work. Most of these operations will spawn worker commands that operate in a fork join model in order to utilize all available CPU bandwidth. Here I'm highlighting the first early part of our main thread, which involves pumping the network on the client side and processing the snapshots as they come in from a raw dispatch perspective. And then we have the actual work interpretation of the snapshot updates, which you can see here are marked by many weights on fork work. Those weights then turn into assists to perform actual work to ensure we're making forward progress. Then our player handling is processed we do this as late as possible so that input sampling is more closely aligned with kicking graphics work. Last, the front end scene rendering, which is a scene graph traversal phase for the world state. The second major thread, the back end thread. It's historically responsible for command buffer generation, but as we'll see later, it's more of a simple graphics device ownership thread given that so much of the actual command buffer generation happens in parallel in other cores and is kicked as early as possible from the front end. Here I've highlighted was that our command buffer submission on the back end. You can see a few chunks are blowing up here. This is where the back end itself has picked up jobs it needs immediately and started work on them. The very heavy hashing in between those is just submitting command buffer that's already been finished by completed jobs. You can also see earlier in the frame where the back end thread is idle that it is picking up some random jobs like processing front end commands and physics. We're sensitive to the idea that it might pick up a long job which causes bubbling so we guard against that with custom job dependency rules. Speaking of jobs going long in latency, let's have a brief philosophical interlude. We think in terms of the GPU always being our critical path. That is, the GPU should never be idle. It should be presenting images as fast as possible to the user and never start for work. If the GPU is idle, we feel we've made a mistake in our work scheduling. And a bubble is the term we have for that blank space that shows up when no work is being done, pushing the frame further out. 
When the frame is pushed further out, it increases the odds we'll miss our V-Sync flip scheduling. And that will cause a frame to persist, cause latency to spike, and create that feeling of jutter you get with occasional repeated frames. Thus, we're very careful to avoid bubbling on the GPU. Scheduling jobs at enough of a granularity ensure they're able to feed the GPU command buffer at a sustained rate with no gaps. And we're willing to trade non-trivial amounts of CPU to improve GPU performance in many cases. You can think of us trying to move such bubbles back through time, from the GPU to the back-end thread which submits work, submits work to the front-end thread which creates the input to the command buffer generation, all the way back to the best place to be idle, which is right before input sampling, because all your work is done ahead of time, and you want to schedule input sampling as late in the pipeline as possible to reduce input to display latency. Getting back to our final major thread, the server thread. It simulates game logic decoupled from update rate of visuals and communicates via loopback shared memory in single player. The server is actually run on a dedicated server instance in most situations in multiplayer, although we also support running it locally on one of the clients as well. These are the so-called listen servers. The fact that the server runs at a separate tick rate provides us wide latitude in scheduling work on the server. We can afford expensive operations such as pathfinding and single player without affecting the client frame rate. It also allows us to increase the server tick rate in multiplayer to ensure it's smooth, low latency play. Here I've highlighted how the server frame is actually around 50 milliseconds, although we're not server limited here, so there's a variety of work it's picking up to assist other jobs with. You can see how essentially three client frames fit up against the server frame. We have the ability to interpolate between arbitrary tick rates, but as you can imagine, there's a sort of state latency that can occur when the interpolation fidelity is under stress at lower tick rates, or when the server goes long, the client state starts to drift from the server. Because the server's view is authoritative, the client will eventually correct to it, which can result in nonlinearity or warping in the client's view. This is really correction of the client prediction's failure to reconstruct signal due to a lack of information. There's complexity to managing the separation between client and server. Both have their own views of the state of the world, and communicating and synchronizing them requires a non-trivial amount of work. It can be tempting when programming client functionality in single player, for instance, to want to peek through the wall and directly examine server state. However, this creates significant problems when memory access is not properly synchronized. This separation is an imposed constraint that allows us to leverage this decoupling, and the payoff is worth the effort. And this idea of copying for memory separation for concurrency will be a recurring one in this discussion. Even it does make it a pain to move an entity render flag all the way over the network so that the renderer can see the correct state for it at some point in time. This is an important point, actually, and so I'll reinforce it again. We often think of constraints as restrictive of art or design, but carefully chosen constraints are one of the most important ways to unlock large-scale transformations and optimizations in our systems. Those constraints may have non-trivial engineering requirements, but they're ultimately what will unlock the quality and performance that deliver value to content creators and players. The most common examples of these are pre-computed lighting and static environments, but the client-server split is in a similar vein. Walking back to our general threading and job model, focusing on the front-end thread here, all of, these work on these, all of the work on these major threads are generally executed as a series of jobs in a fork join model with work spun out to the worker threads. Here you can see our main thread invoke our render scene, which is essentially the scene graph traversal, including around 1.5 milliseconds of UI code, which fills me with a deep and abiding sadness. And some of the other cores, we start executing visibility work. We're also executing visual effects simulation and draw data generation. You can see we're actually not getting good granularity and balance of jobs here either. We're spamming our work queues in the main thread to see if the jobs are done instead of helping out with any of them. And those of you familiar with the site of many syscalls in Razor know that that's not the greatest sign when you see that many tick marks. Last point from our ground up view. All of our primary threads and worker command threads have fixed processor affinity on console. This is in order to ensure optimal memory coherency for execution due to the Jaguar SOC per cluster cache arrangement. We execute work on the second cluster that has the most memory orthogonality. The server thread and audio processing are specifically targeted for this. And as mentioned, the server thread has its own memory representation of entities distinct from the clients, so we run the server on the second cluster. Similarly, audio data has very little interaction with the main client thread outside of some shared data for systems like note track events. You'll notice that there's a worker thread on the second cluster, and also that we discussed previously that the server thread will pick up work when idle. In the past, we've attempted various heuristics to optimally arrange which jobs got picked up by the second cluster workers. We found that in real world scenarios, it was always at least marginally advantageous to suffer the cache pollution exchange for the extra processing throughput. We've also worked to ensure that OS threads like network drivers are affinitized in a way that makes the most sense for data delivery. For instance, the main thread processing snapshots coming in via dedicated servers.
We have attempted similar threat affinity work on PC in the past, but run up against significant difficulty in finding a robust solution that wasn't in conflict with the OS scheduler. This is especially true in the D3D11 era when PC GPU drivers would perform non-trivial work, and in general we were almost always bound on CPU by the primary driver thread. On ARM, we do respect big little configurations and schedule heavyweight threads as appropriate, as you would expect based on what I just explained. As a side note, this slide is from the D3D12 apologetic and why they were restoring background worker threads as a concept in D3D12, which isn't the best decision in our opinion, although we understand why they did it. I'm not sure that we've gone back and retested our thesis on processor affinity on PC recently, which is definitely something we should do. And that's one of the important things about picking a set of constraints. Every now and then you have to go back and re-examine them to make sure the assumptions you decided on are still valid. This reminds me of another digression, which is our approach to, change, our approach to changeless. This may sound a little bit banal, but much of the advanced work that we do on the render is not just about looking forward, but also understanding why changes were made historically. Good changeless discipline is critical for understanding this and stands, in my mind, in stark contrast to the relative uselessness of code comments and documentation. Most comments and documentation are a risk in my mind because they can quickly decouple from the underlying system implementation. Changeless comments, however, are, for the most part, immutable in time and directly linked to the textual changes present in the diffs applied in that change. Our approach is that we don't want them to be descriptive or duplicative of the textual file diffs in the change. What's the point of restating that you renamed a function when the diff tells you that? Instead, we want to know why you made the change you did, what testing you did to validate it, and what were the observed results. With that information, we can go back and test an assumption that was made earlier and validate that the results and benefits are the same as they once were, which is what I should have someone do later this week on PC. This is one of my changes from a couple years back when I still did engineering work and is based on a style popularized by Robert Field when he worked at Infinity Ward. Back to our render work submission. In comparison to the physical CPU and logical thread setup, we can also think of the renderer from the top down as a pipeline of data and tasks moving across threads in time. The front of the pipeline is the state updates to the world simulation. The middle piece is the front end scene traversal, including scene setup, which includes the view, camera data, light state, game mapping between semantic image resources and actual texture data, and so forth. It also kicks the visibility jobs, which are then the input to the draw list generation. The last piece is the command buffer generation and work submission to the GPU, which is owned by the back end. The draw lists are traversed and turned into command buffer, which are then kicked to the GPU in scene submission order. Zooming in, looking at the early part of the front end, during the visibility phase, jobs are kicked per camera, main scene, sun, spots, etc., and then per object type, which determine the visibility of these disparate elements for each camera. We've used a variety of visibility determination approaches through time, from classical portals with narrow traversal to bespoke software rasterization of likely occluders to middleware solutions like Umbra. All of these approaches have varying trade-offs, which we don't have time to explore in detail. Although, hearkening back to my earlier point about retesting assumptions, we did do a fulsome evaluation of these again on a recent title. For the sake of today's discussion, we'll assume that we're using Umbra for visibility determination. In our case, we don't use it merely to analyze the presence of renderable objects in the world, but we also use it to determine visibility of lights, reflection probe volumes, and decals. Culling inactive scene meta objects is a valuable way for us to constrain overall processing as part of our forward plus rendering. Here you can see the majority of our time is spent processing static object visibility. And then a much smaller section here, we're processing what we call scene entity. Two other things worth noting here. You can see a small job embedded at the end of the last static visibility query job. <clears throat> this is a coalesce job that unifies all the per job buffers into the final list. We run it inline rather than have another job kicked and waiting in order to keep the memory hot. And here you'll notice a non-trivial inefficiency. We're spending a lot of time spinning here because our wait is on a job with a long dependency chain and we don't have much else to do. And we're afraid of missing the end of the visibility job so we're not picking up other work. To some extent, this is a legacy of the capture I made, which is an empty multiplayer match. A normal game would have had more work to hide here, but it's still interesting to observe, and I may yell at someone about this. But again, this goes back to the earlier point about concern for bubbles. In the next phase, we populate draw lists which correspond to various passes in the scene, and which map back to camera setups and visibility lists from the first phase. These population jobs are launched according to the specific underlying object type. Brushes, static models, dynamic models, and particle systems. These draw lists include typical passes you'd be familiar with, like shadows, pre-pass, view model, opaque, but also special buckets like subsurface scattering skin materials, and so forth. Each of these draw lists also corresponds to a command buffer chunk, which will later be generated based on the draw list, assuming it's not empty. 
You can also see some of the meta objects that I mentioned previously, like the frustum lights here, which we draw as objects into the bit vector with automics. The object draw lists are split up by semantics of which part of the frame they belong to. Shadows, view model, opaque, skin services, distortion effects, transparencies, UI, etc. Rough categories called out here show us submitting shadows first, then prepass, then opaque, which is broken up into several segments, and then what we call emissive, which is really a deprecated term for transparencies and particle effects. Last, the post-processing chain is submitted. So that's a sort of more granular view of the job flow of each of the pieces of the pipeline. But next, I want to talk a little bit about data flow. And specifically, what I'd like to talk about is data mutability. The draw lists are mutable from the front end's perspective and immutable from the back end's perspective, modulo many years of small, subtle, and shameful hacks here and there. There's a general flow of feeding data forward that is present in a lot of the different stages in the renderer. We're transforming or copying data, or we're transitioning it from writable to read-only as it flows through the pipe. The split between the front end and the back end is the major inflection point with the largest gathered data bundle, the back end data. But there are multiple other variations of this throughout the front end itself as it is forking and joining jobs. I'll try to illustrate the data flow in more detail and talk about why it's structured the way it is at each point. First, there's global render data that's stored in the appropriately named render globals. Then each client has a set of data that belongs to it specifically, including what is known as a reference definition or ref def. In the case of split screen, this will mean two locally collected clients, for instance, and thus two refdef. Incoming packets from the network tell us how to modulate the client state, and then in turn its refdef is updated, as an example the current fog state for the player. There will be a variety of parameters like Rayleigh scattering, etc., that will be interpolated from vision sets that the server informs us are now in effect, and other similar pieces. Something we call the viewport features, which will be passed down into the render front end, which will make a copy and modulate it based on certain render limitations that the client doesn't need to know about most of which are debug tunables, but some of which represent PC optional features and other things. We then begin splitting up the input ref data into pieces based on frequency of specification. Data that needs to be saved as the previous view parameters for temporal effects will be split from others which have no cross-frame references. We now also begin to set up the view info, which will be one of the major first-class objects visible to the command buffer generation as an input. As the view info is set up, so is something we call the command buffer input, which contains a lot of input data specific oddly enough, to command buffer generation. For instance, you want to have a system to map render targets as inputs to later passes, and you can use this system to specify these. They're decoupled in this way so that you can override them, for instance, with black, white, or gray images for various purposes, mostly to bug, but sometimes for real effect in the game. Similar mechanisms exist for constant buffer management in the old push style, although we're moving more and more towards arbitrary packed blobs of data in a pull style these days. We'll also begin setting up the backend data. The backend data represents the interchange between the front end and the back end of the renderer, namely the difference between scene traversal and command buffer generation. There are two of these backend data structures, and as soon as the front end thread is done writing, it will be handed off to the back end as transfer of ownership, and then the front end thread can immediately begin writing the next frame's worth of data. This double buffered pipelining allows us to amortize and overlap work at the cost of some carefully managed latency. Another thing worth mentioning is that we try to avoid any linkage in safe state between the front end and back end. There is very little caching of work in the back end. Everything is feed forward to avoid consistency issues in such designs and the requisite synchronization. We discussed the duplicated back end data for pipelining previously. In the case of split screen, we'll also utilize this double buffered mechanism to begin processing the next back end data for the second viewport. This reduces our pipeline benefit, of course, but given the additional stress on systems to support split screen, it works out all right in balance. And it's most important that we generally have a fully independent set of resources available for the second viewport when possible. Unfortunately, our support is not as elegant as one might hope, but of course elegance and efficiency aren't necessarily bedfellows. It's not uncommon to find various rendering systems disabled to improve performance in split screen, such as tessellation, which has even worse quad efficiency at sub viewport resolution. Moreover, there are some systems whose benefits simply don't exist. For instance, early asynchronous compute jobs, which expect end of framework to overlap, can collide with full cost end of viewport draw work from the first client or due to memory lifetime management, would need to stall for longer than would be desired in order to have correct CPU-GPU synchronization. Last, some systems can be optimized based on the previous frame hints, such as our light grid spatial walk, and this is more complicated to manage in split screen. Some work is amortized, we'll often do tricks like only render one set of shun shadow cascades for split screen. A lot of the functionality that is currently encoded in split screen is a mixture of past legacies as well, picture in picture, stereoscopic rendering, etc. But this screen is still important to the franchise and players, and we do the work to support it even if it's not internally as beautiful as we'd like.
In the case of past features like stereoscopic 3D, we managed to get up to eight backend data swaps per frame, which mostly held 20 hertz for four-player co-op stereoscopic 3D. I'm guessing probably a dozen people ever ran the game in that configuration. Another benefit from mutability analysis is that if you can freeze the data early in the pipeline, you can avoid copying overhead and just refer to it. And copy overhead is something to pay attention to and to make decisions about bulk versus fine-grained, data structure size, etc. Which is why, for example, our drawable interchange data is very referential and tightly packed. Take, for example, our world geometry drawable surface data. It's encoded as a 64-bit integer. That surface index refers to other arrays of data in true SOA spirit. But that data is similarly packed, albeit into 32 bits, and another chunk which is 32 bytes, and so on and so forth. Let's pause for another philosophical interlude in what I consider some of the most important framing ideas of our render design, which are correctness, efficiency, resiliency, and prioritization. First of these, minimize explicit synchronization needs to ensure correctness. This implies a fair amount of copying, and one of the criticisms of our internal engineering team is it can take a lot of effort to move things through the render pipeline. But this data stays immutable as it flows through the pipe, other than the copy points, and thus minimizes synchronization needs, complex mutex systems, etc., as well as the tendency for bugs to creep in due to referencing memory we shouldn't, similar to what we spoke about earlier with the client versus server fence. This isn't a new or novel insight per se. Functional languages have talked about this for years, but we've seen a lot of messes from state mutation, so discipline here really pays off. The downside of these multiple stages is, of course, their cost. Thus, our second goal, which is to minimize the amount of data that needs to flow through the rendering pipeline as much as possible for the sake of efficiency. A more general way we would sometimes say this is that our goal with code and data flow is to minimize total data transformation energy. Each transform you're required to do, whether a copy or calculation, represents the spending of some finite resource in the system, such as memory bandwidth or ALU. Minimizing this keeps the renderer efficient. I also discussed that we value resiliency. We want our designs to be resilient to unknown inputs at a level that is appropriate for the constraints we've chosen. Tools should never assert on malformed input, for instance, but handle errors gracefully and report as much context as possible to the user. Similarly, if we're unable to determine a static limit a priori, we want runtime systems to handle that gracefully. As a simple example, one thing we try to do in our traversal is worth highlighting is that we have a system whereby the front end is responsible for resource allocation used by the subsequent workers. This includes determining the buffers necessary to be reserved in the interchange data structure between the front end and back end. At the top level, these are surface descriptors, but they can also include reserving space in the skinning output buffer or other graphics related structures that are used strictly by the back end. If we're unable to reserve this space, we simply elide the draw at the top level. It's a goal of the renderer that it is resilient to heavy load without crashing. This is especially helpful in the early days when most gameplay was 6v6 DM, and then a kill streak would come in and try to draw the entire map at once, and things would still be handled gracefully. This, for instance, is our top level dynamic model draw code, which, if it has skinned verts, will attempt to allocate them and simply skip it rendering if it can't. Inside that code, a call to another subfunction to get the offset into the skin cache buffer and skip if unable to allocate. And the actual code to alloc from the buffer. The atomics. And if unable to allocate, issue a warning once per frame and then return an error. Another important part of this resiliency is validating it. One thing we encourage programmers to do as part of their testing for check-in is to artificially reduce their limits and ensure that systems still continue to work correctly. In this case, we'd ask them to knock down the size of the skin vertex cache vertex buffer to something trivially small and see what happens. Last, prioritization. This is the idea that you should gauge the value of a change by the area under the curve of exposure to the players over time. If you're working hard to optimize a part of the code that can be very slow, but isn't seen very often, an occasional spike, the area under the curve, that player's expectation is pretty small. However, if you're talking about the trade-off that a lighter needs to wait an extra 45 seconds for the radiositor solver to finish, but the new output will result in a savings of 130 microseconds each frame, and if you multiply that out by the number of play hours, well, you get the picture. This also leads to a sort of corollary, which is the hierarchy of preferred calculation time, which uh, Angelo has so viciously slandered. Let's consider resource allocation within the frame. Because we value correctness and efficiency when we try to disallow anything that looks like dynamic memory allocation during the frame, we want a front load calculation of necessary resources as early as possible. In the best case, we can do that offline by reserving memory for some known upper bound across all of our levels. Then, at boot time, we may make decisions such as which piece of hardware we're running on, resolution of the output device, and so forth. Then, at map load time, we can make a size allocation per specific level based on its contents or the game mode. 
Last, at runtime, we want our allocators to be as simple as possible, which means generally some form of linear allocator with a per frame reset. Another thing I would be remiss if I didn't bring up. These philosophical positions exist not just because of some first principles formulation, uh, such that they were considered good and valuable. Some of them exist because of very strict platform limitations imposed in previous generations, such as the PS3. For those who don't know, the PS3 had many small processors with very little memory. And you had to be very careful in how you explicitly copied memory around and how small your program's working set was. But ironically, this approach didn't just make the PS3 versions of our games possible. It also made pretty much everything faster. And that's because data locality and organization matters. There's a quote from Frank Herbert's Dune that I sometimes think about when considering the impact that the cell had on how we think about programming, at least how it shaped my approach, which is that Arrakis makes us moral and ethical, but I feel like in some ways the cell made us moral and ethical engineers. And that's the end of our philosophical intermission. Let's get back to the frame. So I mentioned before that originally the backend didn't just submit the command buffer, but was also responsible for generating it. However, in the seventh generation of consoles, this became multi-threaded parallel command buffer generation. Here you can see the worker zero thread picking up command buffer generation work, while the backend is also helping and kicking. Because the scene graph traversal is divided into jobs, and they can complete a variety of times, but the backend submits work in a specific order, we want to minimize latency and bubbling by ordering our work submission and kickoff as strictly as possible. To accomplish this, the front-end backend interchange data is actually partitioned into subsections, which are fenced so that we can see when the previous frame's backend is done reading from it and begin writing to it from this frame's front-end. The worker commands that generate the command buffer packets are actually launched from the front-end as their respective scene graph traversal completes, and then these are waited on by the backend before they're kicked to the GPU. As such, the backend does not wait for the front-end to finish processing the entire scene graph traversal. It instead kicks work opportunistically. Here we see that one of the front-end jobs is signaling that we have made sufficient progress in the scene graph traversal to wake up the backend, which unfortunately picked up a long job, some work for us here to improve scheduling heuristics. Here we can see a variety of worker commands picking up draw workers before the backend is even woken up. And now we're actually getting around to kicking command buffers to the GPU up in the corner on the backend thread, and those jobs are already done, so it's just rapid fire kicks one after the other. In addition, if the backend notices that draw work is coming in late, possibly due to poor scheduling behavior or worker commands, it can perform something we call handoff. This is where we interrupt the worker command and kick what work has completed, and then continue with the draw list in the backend itself and submit it to the GPU as quickly as possible. This reduces GPU bubbling, that critical path I mentioned previously, and drives down overall latency. That said, our duffel buffered pipeline scheme in itself introduces some latency, and we have a variety of systems that attempt to control this. Going back to handoff, and showing it on this frame. Here you can see worker one was processing the fourth segment of our opaque draw list. Because our opaque draw list generally tends to be the longest and heaviest, we break it in the corresponding prepass list into segments for better job granularity. This small job here is where we try to run it or kick it to the GPU, but we find it's not ready to be submitted, so we get impatient, flag it, and the worker command stops processing. And now here you can see that same segment picked up by the back end and then submitted directly. In what is now becoming a theme, as I was putting together this presentation, I noticed an inefficiency in the handoff system. Here you can see a very nice tight set of kicks of command buffer. Then we get to our cache spot shadow static draws, and we start waiting and waiting and wait. Specifically on this worker down here, which is taking its time. And so we initiate the handoff mechanism, but interestingly, it can't get the draw work on the worker to interrupt. Instead, the backend picks up a random opaque iterator so as to do some work. I think this is due to the granularity at which we execute our tight inner draw loops, which are highly optimized for minimal possibility of state changes in the inner draw loop. As we've moved to more of a bindless and multi-draw indirect approach with unified shaders, we've continued to coalesce the granularity of these draw loops. I don't think we're breaking out of it frequently enough to check if we should pause our work. Something else to have people look at later this week. A new analysis tool appears. For some of this command buffer generation, a quick introduction to PIX3 for those who haven't used it before. On the top left, a vertical list of events recorded in the command buffer, such as draws, dispatches, resource sets, state sets, etc. On the top right, any details for that event. You can see this resource set is for a buffer object, namely an updated command buffer set. Bottom left, details of what is bounded on the device at the time of this event. And then what I used to spend a lot of time looking at, shader microcode. I mentioned earlier that we have customized inner draw loops. This sort of specialization has long been a feature of the renderer, the idea of having these very specific types of drawable objects. Roughly speaking, these are world, static models, dynamic models, procedural geometries such as particles, glass, and in newer titles, specific terrain geometries. 
Each of these has constraints and also has specific draw code that goes alongside them. In the seventh generation of consoles, the Xbox 360 and the PS3, that draw code was set up to minimize state changes, which in that era meant also just minimizing the surface area exposure to the rendering API. We accomplished this with gross material asset types, and then at data serialization time, we would calculate a much more fine-grained key based on the various draw state requested for each material. This key allowed us to quickly sort assets to minimize those state changes, and was also part of the front-end service emit phase. On the back end, then, this resulted in very optimized command buffer generation for those platforms. Here you can see just two simple constant buffer updates between some draws. This setup does impose a lot of rigidity though. For instance, with the static model draw loop, you couldn't change anything except the reflection probe index and the secondary lighting data index, along with the actual instance transform itself. When we went to later add vertex-based baked lighting and then light map static models, this meant plumbing through a lot of code for those specializations. This is a similar setup for our world draws, albeit in D3D12 now, to give you a slightly different API flavor. Here you can see there's nothing between these draws with predication. Our world materials are in, well, world space, so they don't even need transforms. The supported modulation of reflection probe and light map index doesn't come into play, so it's just pumping out the draws. Over the previous eighth generation of hardware, we had to adjust our notion of sorting to reflect the underlying hardware realities of the consoles. For the GCN GPUs, this meant understanding the importance of context roles, and how, for instance, the vertex and pixel shader state was not a part of the draw context, and now shouldn't be a primary part of our sort key. Although there are values to minimizing those roles, iCache was a surprising impact to performance, around 250 microseconds per frame once we had our heuristic for our pre-caching properly set up and enabled. But the larger point here, of course, is how we reconsider things through the years as hardware and software approaches change. For instance, this is how a chunk of our draw loop looks now, which is all indirect execution with multi-draw. I mentioned our approach to memory allocation previously, and these tight draw loops touch on this as well. In the core draw loops, we may need to peel some memory for constant buffer allocation and command buffer as well. However, we don't want to do anything expensive at per-draw granularity. And we don't want complicated individual allocation schemes either, such as synchronized multi-threaded heaps. For our approach, we have two underlying allocation idioms. We maintain a primary ring buffer for constant allocation, which is fenced to retire chunks and always allows forward progress by the GPU. However, the vast majority of our allocations go through linear allocators that are contained within each of the backend data structures we discussed earlier. Having that ownership aligned with the backend data allows us to avoid any sort of complicated synchronization with the GPU as we already fence on backend data granularity. In order to avoid expensive per draw costs, we reserve chunks from the allocator to higher level using standard atomics. These chunks are assigned to each of the parallel command for generation threads as they need them. And because that ownership is then per thread, we can simply increment non-atomically within that chunk to each draw as needed. The size of the chunk is based on a calculation of the maximum per draw reservation multiplied by a limit on the number of surfaces that we'll iterate on before breaking the loop. We can validate this value offline during shader serialization by noting the maximum size of constant buffer references. So we know that per draw allocations will never fail, but that they might fail at a higher level if we ex exhaust the linear allocator. However, at that level, we can also safely exit our draw loops, which leads to improved resiliency in the renderer. And if we're super clever, we can use the handoff mechanism we discussed previously to continue drawing on the backend thread using the ring allocator, which can always advance. One of the downsides of this approach is internal waste fragmentation if the surface count within the group is low. But that's also indicative of other problems as well in terms of draw grouping efficiency. I wanted to go back to shader microcode and talk about our approach to building shaders and why it is the way it is. This slide is basically the shared trauma for those of us who went through the past 10 years doing microcode optimization. The GPU architecture in the 8th generation of consoles were extremely sensitive to what we call occupancy, which is essentially the number of concurrent workloads that would be processed in flight at any point in time. The underlying hardware had a register file which was split between varying and scalar registers, depending on whether the values were uniform or not across a wavefront. The shader compilers were a bit difficult, and it required a lot of constant effort on our part in order to get our workloads into the shape that we wanted them to be. Hitting that magical four-wave occupancy at 64 VGPRs was a holy grail for us for our forward plus opaque shaders. To achieve this, we spent a significant amount of time hand-building and structuring our lighting loops, our decal loops, etc., with bespoke scalarization tricks. But we also have material composition like any moderately complex rendering system. Many people pursue graph systems, but we still rely on essentially textual processing with preprocessor directives to build all our shaders. Our tight rein on performance has never made us comfortable with permitting the full level of arbitrary expressiveness in a graph system, even at the cost of iteration. And because we're shipping games and not engines, we can spend the time on this level of specialization and optimization. But any permutation system becomes susceptible to combinatoric explosion at some point. On Advanced Warfare, for instance, we peaked at around 400,000 unique pixel shaders for a given map. Tracking performance across all those is impossible, and we pursued several approaches. Automation, 
including a telemetry system where shader statistics are recorded per CI run, and then diffs are produced. And we can examine these from our data builds, but also for local changes, you can queue pre-flight checks and view reports. This is one of our tools, FPS tool, that takes thousands of samples and real game levels and builds aggregate performance data. And what is a massive defeat for our industry's dignity and self-respect, we also ended up bringing back infrastructure to explore shader compiler tunable space via exhaustive compilation and custom performance evaluation heuristics. Some of you will have gone through this with NV shader perf back in the PS3 era and the random scheduler seed permutation. We also aggressively pursued static reductions of our techniques, which subsequently led to reductions in permutations. We did this via careful folding of functionality into static scalar branches in our base forward plus shaders. On some older titles, we had 681 separate techniques, but on more recent ones, we got that down to around 174. Our final philosophical interlude. In the seventh generation of consoles, the Xbox 360 and the PS3, it felt like as a systems and rendering program, our primary work was to learn how to maximize CPU parallelism. And this especially manifested, at least for us, in parallel command buffer generation. In the eighth generation of consoles, it felt like our primary work was in understanding how to generate efficient GPU microcode to exploit GPU parallelism. We spent a lot of time working with shader compilers and learning how to coax them in order to generate that optimal microcode. What will be our primary legacy for the ninth generation of consoles? Will it be a solution to the practical problems of ray tracing? That feels sort of obvious and mildly banal. Maybe something else entirely. I'm curious as to what everyone else thinks. To wrap up, when I think of the benefits we try to exploit because of our global knowledge of the use of our technology, there that our systems are constrained. Many optimization opportunities come from the careful choice of constraints and thus can be specialized. Much of our lighting can be pre-calculated offline because our world is largely static. Our game logic can operate at a decoupled rate because we always operate in a client-server model. And choosing the right constraints is one of the most important things for you to do architecturally. Validated. As workloads and underlying platforms change, you need to revisit your choices and validate they're still the right ones. Good historical record keeping helps inform that validation and the work you're doing today. Prioritized. Prioritize your work by its exposure to the user and make the effort to napkin map the impact. Efficient. Think of optimization as a minimization exercise for energy through a system. Correct. Engineer systems for simplicity of ownership of memory to better reason about synchronization. And finally, resilient. Encode your assumptions at the appropriate level of operation and do the work to ensure robustness. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Some call out here for folks at Activision, as well as Sony and Microsoft, who helped permit this presentation to be as good as I wanted it to be. Thank you very much.